Hey, and welcome or welcome back to the Citizen Channel. I hope you're all staying safe and well. And uh, yes, today it's fanzine memories where we look at various fanzines. Obviously, King of the Kipax is the main one I do because there's so many of them, of course. But uh, okay, we're going to look back at other fanzines as well. And it's it's interesting because we do a lot of official things through the programs and magazines and moments in time, if you like. But uh, yeah, the fanzines are a way of looking how the fans are feeling at a certain point in time, isn't it? Just what the fans fans don't always agree with what the um city city club are putting out there do they let's let's be straight about it the match day programs and magazines are, are mainly pro city there might be some newspaper stuff that isn't but uh yeah, fanzine memories gives us that look anyway from a fan's point of view and today we are uh delving into the king of the kid packs and we're going to go back to the summer 2002 issue. Not a bad time. Not a bad time to be a City fan. This was issue 104. So we're going to have a look. It's in two parts. This is part one. Uh, it's just so much uh, information in these magazines or this fanzine, King of the Kipax. Uh, I'll split it into two parts. So this is part one, please. I hope you can uh, hope you enjoy it anyway, looking back. And uh, just a little snapshot at the time of what was going on. And there's always a big theme in these things. And obviously there is a big theme in this, but we'll talk about that in a minute. Please, if you are new to the channel, push that subscribe button, push the bell notifications, tell your city friends, give us a like, guys, make an old city fan very happy, even give us a like as well, that would be absolutely brilliant. Right, let's get on with this. Yes, interest, interesting cover, uh, the, the things on the wall, you'll have images coming up on screen as well throughout this. Of course, K-Pax or Kipax, obviously, it was uh, put put on the magazine, on the fanzine itself. You'll want to believe him. Yes, yeah, so obviously it was the reign of Kevin Keegan, of course, wasn't it? And just a little background to that film, it was based on the 2001 film K-Pax, of course, about Prot. Yeah, a guy called Prot, a patient at a mental hospital who claims to be from a faraway planet named K-Pax. So there you go. Uh, obviously, that's the links with uh, Kevin Keegan and the K, and uh, well, obviously loose links. But that's that's what a bit of fun is. That's what parodies are. Uh, a new little headline that wasn't there in the early issues of King of the Kipax, uh, a blue bloody Manchester City fanzine for the fans by the fans. Yeah, obviously that sort of comment's been used by a few vloggers over the last few years as well, by the fa for the fans by the fans, which is absolutely fair enough for all these things are for the fans, and it can't. I don't think you can go far wrong with saying King of the Kipax was for the for the fans by the fans, and it still remains so, of course, because it's still kicking along. 52 pages, uh, packed pages, I must, I may add, with small, pr smallish print as well. So there's lots to read in this. £1.50, not too badly priced. And this was actually out for the, because it's a summer one, obviously, and because of printing and various things, uh, there's always games left when these summer ones come out. So it was out for the April the 13th Gillingham away game. The first item is Dave Wallace, of course, the editor, uh, obviously ably assisted by Sue as well, uh, in the court of the Kipax King. Well, he put some of his views and stuff like that. And this was apparently the first end of season scene. I mean, no, no, this is issue 104, don't forget. It's been going quite a, quite a while by then. Um, and obviously this was the first scene where we actually knew where we were at as far as relegation and promotion wise was concerned, obviously we were at the number of season where it was a bit of a, a dodgy season or, or a positive season, and this this was the first time uh, Dave was saying that um, we actually knew what was going on. Of course, Kevin Keegan had led us back to the promised land, hadn't he? he led us back to the top division as champions, of course. We were champions with two games left, ten points clear of the pack. So they were happy days. Yeah, there was a lot, a lot of positivity around the fans at the time. Me personally, and everyone, everyone else. So he sort of looks, looks back at the players and the various season performances. Uh, just. Picked on a couple here. He said Sun GI on for a couple of games did okay. All right, we'd see a lot more of the Sun GI, of course. And Alfie Harland, uh, yeah, obviously, with as I'm recording this, uh, a certain gentleman's just flown into Manchester the evening, yesterday evening, to to sort of have, uh, appear in city shirts and sort of make things before he he goes off somewhere else. Yeah, his son, of course, but Alfie Harland was still injured. Yeah. He, he was injured a lot, a lot, of, a lot of time, Alfie and I think uh, he did struggle. Player of the year was Ali Benabia. 
uh, yeah, we'll have a bit more on that as we go through this fanzine. Interesting thinking, actually, about the, the trouble we had a couple of months ago now, as you I don't know when you're watching this, but as I'm recording this, about the minute silence was ruined at Wembley, a bit of a bit of lack of information, fans on the concourse. Yes, there were people on in the ground doing it as well who were, by the time they were being told to shut up, the Liverpool fans had, had wrecked it by booing anyway. So it all all fell apart. But uh, yeah, interesting because um, in this in this fanzine there was a similar situation where Wolves were having a minute silence, and fans weren't told on the concourse about the stewards hadn't warned fans, so fans were coming to the ground shouting and singing. So very very similar thing, you know, where there's just miscommunication or not listening to communication. So uh, it was strange to see in this uh, fanzine, obviously a similar thing to what happened very recently as I'm recording this. The first uh, first column or the first article is a, a view from a northeast blue. So some guy who lives near Middlesbrough, a guy called Dave Shaw. He saw he started supporting City after watching the match. He thinks it was called the match. Was it called the big match? I think it was called big match rather than just the match. But at the age of eleven, he sort of fell in love with these. Uh, potty city fans who who sort of waved bananas about and were always supportive. So he sort of, even though he's up there near Middlesbrough, he sort of fell in love with City. His actually pride of place in his living room at the time was it was a application for Kevin Keegan's job. Obviously, Keegan got the job. He applied for the manager's job. So uh, Dave was quite confident, obviously. And the rejection letter sat very proudly on his bedroom wall. I think I applied for one once, but I don't think I, I got an answer. I can't remember how I did it. It was a long time ago. I might be dreaming it, but I'm sure I did as well. <laughs> I think that's what most City fans did at the time, just, just with that disgruntled with it all. Uh, he said he was always interesting enough. He said he was always a bit uncomfortable at the main road because of his accent. This Dave Shaw, which is fair enough, Geordie accent, especially when he played in North, you know, uh, North Yorkshire or Newcastle, Sunderland, or one one of those teams. Uh, but so he always had a city shirt on, and he had to, had to show it a couple of times if he had a jacket on and stuff like that. It was zipped up and show his city shirt. Yeah, and interesting, isn't it? Uh, certainly in this day and age, it was certainly Champions League nights, it wouldn't make one ounce of difference. All the accents we hear, etc., etc. But uh, yeah, he was just a little bit wary at the time, which is a shame. But that's that's how it was. I mean, that, we're talking to year two thousand. We're talking the nineties, two thousand. Still, still a bit iffy. The next piece, the goose is dying. So what? Yeah, and this brings us to one of the big themes. I did mention about themes to a lot of these fanzines, and of course, Simon Clark is uh, writing this, and he discusses the ITV. Digital spot. The digital sponsors of the time of the Nationwide League were, were going bankrupt, and there's all sorts of problems being caused for the uh, a lot of the smaller teams uh, as well. Um, and obviously, he was pointing out Simon that this may be good for the league in the long term, and looking at the the things. As we know now, there'll always be a, there'll always be someone ch- willing to come and uh, pay for the pay the money and and sort of disrupt football. And so, obviously. The, uh, even though Simon was quite positive, this might be a good thing long term. Obviously, we know we know what's happened since we know in hindsight, of course. Actually, Sky stepped in and offered offered to take this this on from ITV Digital at the time uh, for a lot less money, uh, but still they took in and got got the foot in the door, if you like. And Simon went on to talk about the benefits. Yeah, the benefits that were obviously to the so-called Big Four, Liverpool, United, Chelsea and Arsenal at the time. The Big Four. And uh, with money and the armchair fans were at a disadvantage of, of smaller clubs, uh, of course. Of these armchair fans of the big clubs meant it was worse for the small clubs. To some extent, City were never a small club, but obviously we were sort of stuck in between, weren't we, at the time? I mean, of course, all these arguments are relevant to the day of these smaller clubs struggling as the big boys uh, gain all the riches and now are one of the big boys, of course, aren't we? Uh, but obviously, we do have there's a generation of armchair support we haven't really got at the moment that other clubs have got, which is, is probably why we get a lot more stick. The Cats Whiskers, a diary of football goings on from the 28th of February to March the 27th. So it covers a month. 
through the media and personal observations. It's a stream of familiar names in football and updates on City games and various rumours, including City that City were actually looking for new sponsors at the time and links had been made to Boddington's, uh, but these had been denied. <laughs> Although, of course, the famous B on the Boddington's would make an appearance many, many years later. Uh, though for sadder reasons, of course, as we know, with the Manchester B and the, and the bombings in, in the arena, etc. Fred Eyre and James H. Reeve warn us, warn us that Stockport have the Indian sign on us. Well, they were pretty, pretty right about that one. There'll be more on Stockport in a bit as well. GMR secured the rights to City Games until 2005. So there you go. You can listen to it on a Greater Manchester Radio. And City were being linked with Jap Stam. Jap Stam at the time. Well, that would have ruined a good song, wouldn't it, if that had uh, followed through. 55 Years and I'm Still Here is by Alan Robotham. He continues a personal story. I think this is part two of his story of the Blues. And he starts at nowhere better in this one, but uh, the 67-68 season. And he was at Newcastle the final game and went back to to the Astley Arms. I don't know if that, uh, anyone of you guys know where that is to, to give the United fans some stick when he got back for that one. And he sort of finishes at the 69 FA Cup final. So another good place to finish. And obviously he promises more in the next issue. The New Romantics is a column by Gary Bradbury. It talks a variety of football and city stuff from the potential demise of Berry at the time. I mean, obviously that, that uh, you know, again, um, links to what happened in recent years. And for or against a couple of our keepers at the time, Carlo Nash, Versus Nicky Weaver. I think we've got something on them again later on in this part or part two. Uh, yeah, so obviously there was a lot of argument as to which was the better of the keepers, Nash or Weaver. How was it for you? Of course, a regular thing that we still get in King of the Kipats looks back at City's 1 0 win over Palace on the 16th of March. And Louise Deeks does a little, little summary of that one where we as fans said goodbye to Andy Morrison on that one on the pitch uh, with his kids. He had to actually play for us for a long, long time. Uh, he'd been struck by injury and hadn't, hadn't played for a while, but he said his farewells on the pitch for that one. And then obviously 19th of March, Stockport 2, City 1. Yeah, Sean Riley reports on this one. Oh dear, and a kick up, a kick up the bum for City. Uh, we finished that game with 10 men and it didn't derail our promotion chances, but what a gutting game that was. I mean, it was awful. It was absolutely awful. I think we'll have a bit more on that as well again. Rotherham 1-1 on the 23rd of March. Uh, Rotherham 1, City 1. Sean Riley looks at that as well. We had to battle from a goal down in this one. Uh, no no Colin Bell winner in this one, was there? We went to Rotherham and all, the, all that one. City 3, Forest nil on March the 30th. And our, my old friend, and our old friend, and still a friend, uh, Phil Banerjee reports on this one. Uh, with a, where the fans apparently the Forest fans serenaded us with "You've never won f all," which uh, oh, bless them. But uh, I suppose even now they can still sing about "We've never won the European Cup" as other clubs do, like Villa who've done it. So yeah, but we've certainly won something, haven't we? Now, so they can't sing that, but they'll just swap it, of course, for for the European Cup, won't they? Uh, if we meet them any time soon, which is possible, they're not they're not through yet to the Premier League but they are in the playoff final as I'm recording this, so you'll know more than I will when this goes out. Wolves nil, City 2, yeah, April the 1st, great game, great game that. I remember that, a lot of that game were absolutely brilliant. Sean Ryler reports on this as well, it's a 1pm kickoff. And in fact, Sean reported on every single away game that season for King of the Kipak, so well, well done Sean on that one, but a great game. City 5, Barnsley 1 on the 6th of April. Yeah, Steve Parrish, the Blue Vicar. Yeah, he, he reports on this one. And City are back and uh, the Blue Vicar reckoned we'd stay. Uh, well, he had to have faith, didn't he, the Blue Vicar? And uh, yeah, he, he, was, he was pretty spot on, wasn't he? That we're back in the Premier League to stay. We certainly were. He probably couldn't have envisaged what happened to us, though, could he? Safe as Houses is by Tony Grace. And he has a look at goalkeepers. Said we get back to goal, isn't it? From Peter Benetti, the cat, who I never forgive for England 2, West Germany 3 in 1970, but uh, <laughs> that's my personal grudge. He, of course, uh, worked for Keegan, but Tony considers, of course, our current custodians, Nash and Weaver again, who he doubted would be the answer. Well, Tony, Tony knew, knew his stuff there, didn't he? 
Shades of 1966. No, it's nothing to do with Alan Ball, this one. Ken Cottrell makes comparisons of this team, Kevin Keegan's promotion-winning team, with the promotion-winning team of 66, of course, uh, with the style of play and... Uh, Admitted that he was underwhelmed by the appointment of Kevin Kevin Keegan in the first place. I'm not too sure how I felt at the time. I can't really remember now, to be honest with you. I think it seemed. I thought, I thought it was okay. I thought. I thought I was. I was reasonably happy with it. Uh, but of course, Ken went on to say he was so happy that he'd been wrong. And so say all of us at the time. I think we're all pretty happy with that. Burfield, yes, Mr. Burfield talks about the champions and runs a spotlight over some of the players. Yeah, well, he included John Macken. He said he, John Macken, interesting player. He said he was quite impressed, uh, though he considered him more of a cover player uh, for Kevin Keegan. Um, and that Kate, if Keegan brought in someone like Robbie Keane or Alan Smith, then Macken would be sort of backup, if you like. OK, no Keane or Smith. Uh, but, yeah, Macken never was a regular starter in his time at City. And he was, yes, more or less cover for other players. He goes on to talk about uh, what it'll do to stay up, what it'll take for City to stay up, uh, despite spending about fifteen million the previous season. He reckoned about thirty million would probably be needed for this season. Although in reality, he did admit this was this was never going to happen, um, but obviously we did it anyway. And he's less than happy at Warnock Sheffield United's team's dark arts. Obviously, watching football this season. Uh, playing football more like more like rugby, not 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 in the proper way, uh, and not alone. He also cites uh, Stockport, West Brom, Rotherham, and Palace, who also got called out for playing, let's say, a, a lower standard of football, a little bit physical. I talked about the main road tour. Yes, I went on one when the new Kipax was built. That was the first time I went on one when there was big. High three tier kickbacks, of course, and he took the kids and he said he he felt he gave him a bit of the eebie-jeebies being on the top level of the kickbacks. It, it did for me. Um, I'm not too sure how our third tier looks. I mean, I remember I was in the I was in the third tier for a couple of seasons, but I can't remember now whether it was any worse or any better. Let me know what you think. Good for pigeons, though. Although the odd ho Harry the Hawk is it? Was it Harry the Hawk? I can't remember his name now. Was <laughs> zanging up, but uh, the pigeons enjoyed it anyway. Good bird's eye view, as you say. Uh, Gary Flitcroft, yeah. Then with Blackburn, of course, was in trouble for some extra marital dalliances, and the press were on his back. Uh, Burfield leaps to his defence, not not from his indiscretions, but as to the scale of the witch hunt by the Red Tops. It's probably something to do because he used to be a City player. And he finishes off with his season awards, lots of different things. Uh, and amongst them, he's got his worst City team performance. Well, I think we all agree with that one. Stockport away, absolutely no doubt about that. Home in a Taxi Award was for Grimsby, who brought a, a magnificent 257 to main role to watch the game. And worst pitch, yeah, he, he gave it to Palace. He said it was like a pike. This is his words, not mine. Like a pike is campsite without the sofas. <laughs> but yeah, it's not too bad when I went there this season. April Shower by Colin Nichols is a parody, a bit of a parody on goings on at main road. Yes, yeah, a little skit, and uh, of course it includes David Bernstein catching Keegan apparently caressing a Newcastle shirt in his, in his office. It's that sort of parody, and it ends up with uh, Keegan nudging Bernstein to consider Stuart Pearce as a manager. And yeah, Bernstein convinced, convinced, sacks Keegan on the spot, and of course he leaves the office, and Keegan is happy and gets his Newcastle scarf out and starts uh, dancing around, dancing around his office. Yeah, so Colin Nichols ended it by saying it could happen. Mm. Well, it did about three and a half years later, uh, didn't it? But uh, well done that man. Although it didn't, he didn't last long at Newcastle the second time around. But Stuart Pearce, anyone spot on? It's funny how some of these things do come right. Not quite in the same way they were meant, but interesting. The thin red line is by Simon Curtis. Yeah, Simon Curtis writing for the King of the Kipax talks of City's bright new future under Keegan. But spares a thought. Spares a thought. I, I wouldn't have spared a thought for him. To those left in our dust in the nationwide, including, including past big boys like Forrest. But I, we'll see. You know, we only might be back in the big time very soon. And that's part one finished, guys. Uh, say, say that's why I put it into two parts because it's quite a lot. 
crashed into the it's packed into this magazine so i hope you enjoyed that and please join me soon or join me uh for part two which will be appearing two or three days after this normally i usually i usually stagger them a little bit uh, a few more mem- fan memories. Hope you enjoyed it, including that from Phil Banerjee again and the Infernal Dante as well. So that's going to be in part two of this. So please don't, don't also know this is still available. Don't forget the King of the Cape. Actually, you can still buy it subscription only, but it's cheap enough. I'll have some stuff on screen for you there, how much it is, etc. But uh, please give Dave and Sue your support for that wonderful, uh, wonderful last man standing as far as fanzines are concerned. Just as good now as it as it's ever been. Anyway, hope you enjoyed this. Join me for part two very soon. Thanks for watching. I only ask one thing, don't I? Please stay safe, everyone. Come on, city. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.